So hello, my name is Gary Brownstone. I am a graduate of St. Paul's class of 76. And on behalf of the Alumni Association, I'm really pleased to introduce today, Dr. Daniel Wolf, who was a classmate of mine at St. Paul's. And I was thinking the other day, I guess that means we met when we were about 14 years old. Daniel served as the principal of Queens University from 2009 to 2019 and is now on leave, but will be returning to the classroom there in the fall. He has a Bachelor of Arts Honors degree in history from Queens and a DPhil, which I suppose we would call a PhD here. Am I right? Yep. In, uh, that's right. Modern history from Oxford University. Daniel has led a distinguished career as both a professor and in senior management. And uh, the coolest thing about what we're doing here today is I'm actually interviewing someone who has their own Wikipedia page. And I would urge you, if you want to learn more about Daniel's uh, really renowned career, to, uh, to check him out on. Wikipedia, and I will also say I learned two new words while I was preparing to do this, which I hope we get a chance to talk about. One is the word Festschrift, ah. and, and the other, I think I have this right, is uh, historiography. Hist oh, uh, very, very much. Potatoes, yeah. Historiography. Oh, historiography, yep. Yeah, yeah, which I, I think is a fascinating subject, so I hope we get a chance to talk about both of those. So. Daniel, I'd like to sort of connect the dots from the present back to your time at St. Paul's and um, maybe start with some career um, type questions. And, you know, like you, I've had the chance to mentor and work with a lot of young people. And one thing I tell them is everybody gets to carve their own course in life. And we don't always plan A to B, that sometimes we take a meandering route there. And yours has had some interesting turns. So I'm wondering first if you can tell me um, what is the job of a principal at Queen's University? Yeah, I mean, it's a good one. I mean, Queen's and McGill and a couple of other places in Canada have a principal every, everywhere else in Canada and uh, most places in the States call it a president. Uh, so essentially, you're the CEO of the university. You, you report directly to the board of trustees or the board of governors. And uh, you have a number of uh, vice principals or vice presidents who report to you and uh, deans and so forth. Uh, it's a job that I think has changed a little bit since, you know, people who were presidents when you and I were students. Uh, and that a lot of the job is really very externally focused. So a lot of fundraising, uh, a lot of government relations, uh, a lot of just simply traveling a lot to promote the university, uh, either on your own or with a larger delegation. Sometimes you get drafted to go travel with the premier or the governor general, you know, just to show off how great Canadian universities are and so forth. So uh, what that meant was that um, in any given week during the 10 years I was uh, principal, uh, I, with the exception of maybe Christmas holidays and uh, summer holidays, there was a, virtually no week where I spent seven consecutive nights at home. And, uh, I, I, one of my favorite little parting gifts uh, as I stepped down, apart from the nice things that the university gave me, was a model 787 from Air Canada to mark my uh, going past a million miles uh, life oh, yes. life, uh, travel. So uh, that's uh, sitting on my on my shelf somewhere. So, so it's it's a very job. And, you know, I, uh, I, I had, like most uh, presidents or principals, uh, a good team of VPs, and particularly some, uh, an officer called the provost, who is in a sense kind of like the COO. And, uh, they they really oversee the day to day management of, of things uh, so that uh, the principal can be out and about uh, shaking the money tree. Well, I think you're being a little humble because I read somewhere and I quote that you fundamentally changed the role of Queen's principal. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's true or where, where that got where that got read. I mean, I, I I probably did maybe push it a little bit further in terms of external, and I actually introduced the concept of a provost here, which Queens hadn't actually had, but we were we were way behind uh, other institutions in 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 doing that. So in, in that sense, uh, it maybe it was a bit of a shift. Yeah, congratulations. I, I suspect it's challenging times for universities on many fronts. 
Uh, it sure is, is and I, I must say it was it was a great run, and I enjoyed it. Uh, not, not every day, as in most jobs, but uh, by and large, enjoyed it. But um, uh, there's a lot uh, in in life that is timing, and I have to say, exiting in 2019 and not having to wrestle with COVID uh, was a. Uh, I, I wish I could claim it were brilliant timing on my part, but just a happy, happy <clears throat> circumstance. But Daniel, I don't think you've given us the full job description because isn't part of the role of the university principal something to do with handing out cookies? Well, uh, funny you should mention that. Uh, I'm glad you noticed. Boy, you really did your homework, Gary. Um, we, uh, my wife and I started this. Um, uh, in my second year as principal, which was sort of 2010-11, we had, a, a, I would say, almost a campus mental health crisis. We had a number of deaths by suicide, a couple of just accidental deaths on campus. So the morale come April was pretty low. So we thought we needed to do something just just by way of you know cheering people up. So my wife came up with the idea of handing out cookies in the library during exams. So we started with you know maybe 400 cookies and found out they just went like that. And by the time we finished, uh, the, the last year was 2019, we were giving out I would say probably close to 2,000 cookies, and we actually had to have uh, assistants to come and help carry the bags. Uh, wow, but it went it went over it went over really well, and I think it was also appreciated by uh, by the students. Okay, so Daniel, but you didn't set out to be a principal of a university. You no. set out to be a historian in uh, Tudor and Stuart history and historiography. <laughs> so, uh, it's so absolutely right. I mean, to, to your to your point earlier about the unusual turns that life takes. Uh, I mean, I, I think I've been very fortunate in that uh, uh, you and I both had the same good history teachers, that uh, uh, good teachers generally at uh, at St. Paul's, and uh, uh, I guess I, I had uh, somewhat atypically identified a sort of academic career as a historian as the route I wanted to take uh, as early as sort of midway through uh, through high school. So thanks to, you know, Nick LePeng, Len Sitter, and Richard Grover, all of whom taught me uh, history, and I suspect you too. Um, but I was very, very fortunate in that, you know, coming out of uh, grad school in the early 80s, uh, there were not very, very many jobs. And uh, I got, you know, very, very fortunate in landing a tenure track job at Dalhousie in 1987. And there I thought I would stay teaching Tudor and Stuart history and a little bit of historiography. Um, and then, you know, just things, things happen in your life and career. And, uh, uh, I got drafted into being an associate dean of grad studies, uh, fairly late in my time at Dow, at Dalhousie, found out that I had, you know, it was, you know, some aptitude at administration. So thought, well, maybe it's time to maybe consider a, a move, uh, because I've always sort of valued travel and being able to see different places. So um, I just put my hat in the ring for a deanship at McMaster at that point, and uh, to my great surprise, uh, got the gig and then got a bigger gig as a, as a dean at the University of Alberta a few years later, and that ended up putting me back at Queens in 2009. None of this was planned, not in the, not in the, in the least. But I think that you never really stopped being an educator. Am I correct that even as principal, you continued to teach or supervise? Yeah, I continued to teach grad students, and uh, I, I made a point of doing some teaching every year I was principal. Um, uh, there, there were a couple of reasons for that. One was, you know, I, I always saw the administrative gig as a temporary temporary stop. I never thought it would go, you know, 20 plus years. Um, so the other thing is, you know, it was a great uh, sanity uh, saver just to be able to get into the classroom and to keep up my research. You know, there were there were some constraints. I, I had to pretty much abandon my sort of earliest interest in sort of uh, what do you call coal face uh, history of British history, going to the archives and so forth, because. Uh, just the time commitment involved in doing that is, is very, very difficult just to get away for even a week. 
Um, but I, I sort of evolved by that point to be doing historiography. We can talk a bit about what that is uh, in a minute, if you like. Uh, and that was much easier to do from here. And uh, so uh, I sort of kept that up. I kept that up a little bit and did a little bit of teaching, and uh, which I think I'm very glad I did because otherwise I'd be rustier than I'm already going to be when I go back to the classroom next year. Yeah, but I, I do think it's interesting how uh, I'll call it, well, two passions, maybe three kind of came together to shape your career. I mean, clearly your love of history um, and uh, the research and you're quite well published and well known and well renowned in your field, um, your passion for education um, and the connection to students but also you ran a business and I'm going to guess that Queens must have had an operating budget in the $300 million range plus or minus. Uh, yeah. A little higher than that, but uh, than that. yeah, but uh, it was, it's I mean, a, that's, that's a big a, operation. Yeah. It's a pretty big corporation to operate. So, uh, you know, kind of three different uh, sides to the triangle of your career. I would say. Yeah. Well, yes. again, I mean, the, it's it's funny. Uh, people often ask me what my preparation for an admin career was. You know, did I have an MBA or something, or go to a business school like uh, like you? Mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, no, not at all. My best preparation was being a historian of uh, 16th and 17th century England. <laughs> because there are many, many similarities between a Tudor Stuart monarch and a university principal. Uh, uh, you, you, you have to build by consensus and consultation. Um, you have a House of Commons, the Senate. You have a House of Lords and your board. You've uh, you've got uh, very very powerful feudal magnates, otherwise known as deans, who, yeah. have, uh, who can be quite baronial. And I know I was one for ten years at two different yeah. places. Uh, so it was actually good uh, good prep. What you don't have, uh, which maybe some maybe the Tudors and Stuarts had, was the ability to behead somebody. But, yeah, right. Yeah. Probably a good thing. <laughs> well, I think I think I'm going to move on from from your career, but I I do think that the sense I get is there is a line I came across, and I think that you would really like this written about you. And it says, overall, this is when you were principal. It says, overall, Wolf's office looks more like that of a scholar than it does of an administrator. So even though you varied off your course as a scholar. You never lost the look, and I think you're probably pretty happy to be back to that room. I, I am actually. You know, it, it was just remarkably easy to, to to. My wife and I were a little worried, you know, how you're going to change gears, and uh, I just found it really, really easy. And I think again, it's partly because I kept up some of the teaching and the research while I was off, and uh, I went. So I'm actually now as busy as I ever was as principal. It's just doing doing different stuff and. Uh, and again, that goes to the, you know, uh, the career changes you make and you know this as well. You've changed uh, gigs a number of times. Definitely. Yeah. So, sorry, Daniel, you talked a little bit about where your um, love of history came from and you named some of your St. Paul's teachers. But what about your, was there a, a, an interest in education that you developed somewhere along the way in being an educator? Uh, yeah, there was. I mean, again, partly just uh, your teachers are apart from your parents are perhaps your earliest influencers in life. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, very, very fortunate. In my, in, I would say most of my teachers from from grade one to grade 12. And uh, but also my, my parents had a strong academic connection. I had uh, I had and actually still he's still living an uncle who was a uh, very successful historian in his own right. And you may recall, I actually brought him to St. Paul's uh, mm -hmm. to give a talk on fascism back in 1974, 75. Uh, uh, well, he's he's long since retired, but he was a bit of an inspiration, handed me my very first real history book when I was eight years old. I still got it on my shelf over there. Uh, plus, my mother was a part-time English professor at the University of Winnipeg in Manitoba. My dad was adjunct at the University of Manitoba Medical School. So uh, there was sort of academia in, in, in the family. And um, uh, I guess in some ways, I was almost kind of pre-programmed to pursue that, uh, that course. Excellent. And um, we all went to St. Paul's for different reasons. What was your reason for going to St. Paul's? 
Well, it's interesting. I actually now sit on the board of, a, of an independent school in Peterborough, Ontario called Lakefield College. And um, in grade eight, when for a whole bunch of reasons, we were looking at a, a different school for me, um, it was actually down to Lakefield or St. Paul's. I was either going to go away or, or stay home. And in the end, I can't even reason, remember why I decided to stay home. And you know, I think it. Uh, I think it was the right, the right call, and it made some lifetime friendships and uh, connections. Our our class, as you know, is particularly tight. Um, I, I think in some ways it was just a kind of convenience, and it was uh, you and I lived next door to each other on Bower Boulevard, and your yeah. uh, house is still there. Mine isn't, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, it was a two, two, two big block walk rather than a bus ride to the school I was going to previously. Uh, right. So that was attractive. Um, uh, no other particular reason uh, than than that. And did you get involved in any extracurriculars when you were at St. Paul's? Uh, I got involved in some more successfully than others. Um, intramural football was a very short-lived uh, thing in uh, grade nine. I was a uh, pretty short kid at the uh, time, didn't do most of my growing until grade 12 or first year university. Um, and I did debating for a little while, and then I realized that I could not possibly compete with the likes of Gary Brownstone <laughs> at, uh, at debate. Um, so I guess probably my two biggest activities were Reach for the Top and the Crusader newspaper, which uh, I did. Uh, I, I was actually the the editor with a couple of other class members uh, uh, in our last year, seventy five, seventy six. Mm -hmm. And one of one of the strong sort of guiding principles of St. Paul's is the notion of developing men for others. I know you're a humble person, as I mentioned earlier, um, but I think that you have found a number of ways to give back to your various communities over the years. Do you want to talk about any of those? Uh, sure. Well, I, I sit on a number of volunteer boards. Again, I just mentioned the the other school board that I just joined. Um, I'm sit on relatively recently. I sit on something called the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario, which is a, a government sponsored but arm's length uh, assessment body. Um, and for a number of years, I've been on the board of something called Historica Canada. And if you're familiar with the the Heritage Minutes and the Canadian Encyclopedia, they're both products of Historica Canada. It's a, it's a terrific board. It's got people like our former Governor General David Johnston, uh, Rick Mercer, Peter Mansbridge, uh, former Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, and uh, and so forth. So it's just it's just a real honor to to do that. And um, uh, so that sort of keeps me occupied volunteer uh, volunteer wise, mm -hmm. and um, I also spend a fair bit of the time on uh, in research doing what I would call sort of trying to help younger scholars get ahead. Get ahead. Uh, awesome. So it's it's often quite hard to get that first foot onto the onto the academic rung if you're trying to get published the first time and so forth. So a couple of my projects that I have ongoing right now are, are deliberately. You know, deliberately targeted to have a mix of more established people, but also recent PhDs, you know, PhD students, and and so forth. Well, and you know, if I could be so bold, I, I'm going to say that I, I, from from what I've observed and read and known of you over the years, I think that <clears throat> the commitment that you've made to your students goes way above and beyond um, what I think of the traditional role of a university principal or president. Um, we talked about cookies earlier. I read a story that I would put under the bravery category that you used to, or at least one year, went door to door, knocking on students' doors <laughs> to talk about modifying their behavior during homecoming week. Yeah. Yeah. So Western grad, I know what homecoming means at those schools. Yeah. That's a brave thing for a university principal to do. Well, we had just brought it back after five years gap. Uh, my predecessor had had, I think entirely, entirely correctly, had to cancel it for a couple of years in 2008. And I extended that by a couple of years. So 2012 or 2013 was the first year we brought it back and we were determined we just couldn't let the massive parties get out of control. And uh, 
I don't know whether it had any effect, but it, I think it, it did send a clear message going through the university district, knocking on doors, and uh, there were some fantastic tweets, uh, such as <laughs> my, my favorite one being that feeling when you are still in your uh, your something or other onesie and Principal Wolf knocks at your door. <laughs> 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 but I do the the commitment back to your students shone through in everything that I read about you, notwithstanding all the um, recognition and accolades in your career. I, you know, I think that that to me anyway, that spoke to me as being really that Jesuit spirit and that commitment to learning and education. And as you mentioned, you know, a real homage to your own family of origin and, and your upbringing. Yeah, I think the school is great at inculcating that kind of uh, service uh, spirit, and um, yeah, very much that was the, I would say the the ethos when we were there, and uh, you know, forty odd years later, glad to see it uh, it still is. You have maintained an ongoing connection to the school, and in particular to our class group, for forty odd years, as you said. Can you kind of explain that? Like that's well, it's really, I mean, we, we are unusual. I mean, most of the people I know in my sort of post St. Paul circle have either never been back to their high school, you know, don't know what people did and so forth. Um, I, I would say I give a lot of credit to the resident Winnipeggers in, in the class, you know, you, um, Richard Swiston, uh, Especially Shale Glesby, who's you know kind of our you know Uber you know ring ringleader, and you know it's just a good group. And you know, let's face it, we were a class of ninety something, and some of us we never actually had classes together. So and some of us did, but uh, it's been interesting to go back to the, to the reunions and uh, uh, have the email exchanges, and we keep up with you know however these families are doing through you know good times and of course we've had some some bad ones in the class as we get to a certain age uh so i think it's been you know particularly as you get you know we're we're all in our 60s now and uh it uh you know when you start realizing also particularly that your tomorrows are fewer than your yesterdays keeping in touch and recircling back to your earliest connections i think is really important Although I think you lucked out. I think you're one of the youngest ones in our class because you're a December baby. Right? I am a December baby, and yeah. uh, I started school probably a year early, so uh, so I'm 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 just short of sixty two. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, do you have uh, a two final questions? Is there any advice that you would offer to any St. Paul student today? Um, well, um, a couple, couple of things. First of all, you know, your your path may be chosen by you, but it may also be chosen for you by things that are not under your control. And you need, particularly more in this generation even than ours, uh, you need to be really, really flexible and, and adaptable uh, because uh, the economy, the technology and everything are changing rapidly. Secondly, education is a process, not a goal and a one-time thing. So seriously consider continuing your education past St. Paul's, past even university if you, if you can. Um, thirdly, again, what we just talk, talked about, you know, find, find a good you know, network of uh, friends. Uh, you may move away, but we're in an electronic universe. Now, which we didn't have the ability of when we were students, really up until the 90s. And uh, that's just a fantastic way to keep in touch with, with people from home because um, you only go through life once and uh, you'll meet new people, but sometimes the old friendships are the best. Great advice. Yeah. Remember, we used to have to remember what the price of a stamp was because that's how we would communicate. That's with right. People who What's were a stamp? Far away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, listen, Daniel, I want to thank you for doing this and, and uh, you know, I've really enjoyed getting caught up because of our personal connection, but also um, for the St. Paul's uh, community. And, and, you know, I'll throw in my two cents worth that um, St. Paul's for me was a phenomenal experience, but the part that impresses me the most is when I look at the um, fine young men that turned into fine old men over the years, <laughs> I'm really impressed with the diversity, with the um, success rate with the commitment back to the school that we've demonstrated 
And it, for me, it's a real honor to be associated with people like you and have that connection, I say, of having served a full sentence and done, done the full four years at St. Paul. So really well, great. Well, I've always been proud to be a 76er. Yes, and uh, I hope to see you again, uh, COVID permitting, at our next reunion. You got one coming up next year. Excellent. I'll look forward to catching up then. Thanks a lot, Gary. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. You too. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.